absolute pleasure to be joined by uh, Matt Bateman, who runs the Montessorium Think Tank, which I guess is a branch of higher ground education, which tries to make Montessori mainstream. So I think today we're just going to be diving in a Montessori ins and outs, what it's about, um, play it, maybe trying to level some criticism at it and see <laughs> yeah. how, how Matt takes it. Um, It'll be fun. See how Maria holds up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so the reason I wanted to have you on is just a growing self-awareness on my part that my sort of relationship to learning and knowledge has sort of changed over time and pretty dramatically in like the last few years. And so I think I have a much more healthy relationship with it now where like I'm really driven by my own curiosity um, and there's no sort of like natural bound set on my learning. I just dive into a subject and when I feel like I've gotten to the bottom of what I want to get to the bottom to, I stop and move on to other things. Whereas I feel like my education in school, even up to like the undergrad level, wasn't exactly like that. And so I've been just taught, you know, I was very like test driven, grades driven, etc. And I didn't have, um, I don't think I had a unique educational experience, like pretty typical public education in Canada. Uh, and so I've just been toying with the idea of like, is there a way to realistically have made my education, my grade school education, a little bit more what learning is like to me now? Yeah. Instead of sort of driven by more instrumental goals. Yeah. And so I'm I'm still unsettled on the answer to that question. And I think, you know, a lot of people have criticisms of the educational institution and various stages of it. And there's lots of different solutions out there, you know, from like abolishing the whole thing to making everything incredibly strict um, and regimented. And so Montessori seems like one method that's actually relatively well thought through and has some like evidential backing and stuff. And so I just wanted to spend some time basically picking your brain about the foundations, how successful it's been, uh, your like personal experience with it and whatnot. So maybe ending my soliloquy, I'll just let you introduce yourself. And yeah, so yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's great. And I already have so many thoughts. I mean, just just the issues that you raised where look, there's a certain there's a certain way that education is a- approached and what we could probably inaccurately, but colloquially call traditional education or the status quo education system, um, you know, K-12 through university, at least in uh, a lot of places in North America and Europe, um, um, has this, has a pretty regimented feel and a pretty um, transactional um, incentive structure. Um, maybe maybe even transactional isn't, isn't the right word, but um, um, th- there's, and, and there's all sorts of issues that you could peel apart about that. So, um, one, I mean, I'll get to who I am in a second, but I just can't resist. So, so one, so one of them is, um, you know, if you just, even if you just take the things that you studied in school, whatever you studied, what did you study in undergrad? Um, I did math and computer science, yeah. math and computer science. I mean, you could, you could probably imagine a version of what you did that just has like better content teachers and is just like more exciting and inspiring. Like, like if you think of like the best class that you ever took and how mm-hmm. good that teacher was at like motivating the questions and like getting you into it, it's like, why isn't everything like that? Why is it that like, you know, I don't know what, what classes you particularly hated, but, but a lot of people have this experience of like, wait, like in retrospect, I spent like seven years in social studies or French or whatever it is. And I learned literally nothing and it was boring the whole time, but, but they can, everybody can also remember that that one literature class or that one math class where like the professor was really into it and it was hard and inspired and and everybody got into it, but you still got a grade at the end. So, so, so there's that issue. And then there's the issue of, um, I can't remember who said this, like Paul Graham or Balaji or one of these people who's like, why in real life you are faced with very, very difficult tasks at which, um, a kind of you know, maybe not mediocre, but like a middling performance is like a real achievement. Like you've accomplished something. Mm -hmm. And in school, you're faced with extremely easy tasks for the most part on which you're expected to achieve perfection. And and, and you're ranked in this very kind of ecologically invalid way with grades and tests and other things like that. And there's something very odd about that whole structure. Um, And and all those things mixed together to give you an overall feel, to give most students an overall feel in, in, in school like something is very odd about the way that you learn in school versus the way that you learn in real life. And, and it's hard to kind of peel apart the different layers and figure out how to do it differently. But that we can talk about that more. Who I am, I'm Matt. I, um, yeah, I run this think tank that we really just formally launched like two weeks ago um, called Montessorium. And the purpose of this think tank is to get at the truth in education, particularly the philosophy of education, the big picture, humanistic picture of education. I think when a lot of people hear education think tank they think either like policy think tank like 
mm-hmm. access, like social justice, mm-hmm. school choice, like whatever your your um, pet issue is, or they think research, psychology, like we're mm-hmm. figuring out what really works, and we're neither of those things. We're like, let's look at three thousand years of education and mm-hmm. figure out how Aristotle got it right and wrong, and mm-hmm. you know how that compares to Dewey, and what are the, even the different threads in education today, and mm-hmm. like what can we figure out from that about what the truth is. Um, and, and as you mentioned, this is an offshoot of higher ground education. Um, where I've been doing this kind of work, this kind of like in-house intellectual philosophical think tank work for really the last five years. Higher Ground is a, is a startup. We've got 90 schools across the world, um, birth through high school, um, that that use the Montessori method in a, in a pretty pure way, I think, in, in the younger ages. And then in what I would say is a principled way, um, but probably an impure way mm. um, historically um, a, as you get older. Um, so we're really... You know, as you can probably tell from the think tank, we, we like we're like the Montessori child. We're like, I want to think things through myself and be free to make our own mistakes and then arrive at the truth. And and, and that is what we do. And typically the truth is heavily informed by and influenced by um, the, the principles of Maria Montessori. So that's who I am in a nutshell. I mean, I have a first career as like an actual academic. Um, I, I have a philosophy PhD and I used to work in tech and there's all sorts of other things that you could know about me. But um, sounds you know. like multiple lives. <laughs> it's, it, it's it's you know it's interesting it's um i mean this is related to education a lot of interesting people that i know i mean really everybody just has mm-hmm. one life and um and there's this steve jobs line in his commencement speech about how like the dots only make sense mm-hmm. kind of like looking backwards not necessarily looking forwards you can't plan it all out but um one of the things that the education system is really bad at setting you up to do is to recognize that you live in a world and you have this life where you can be very nimble and where the parts can add up in counterintuitive ways and where you can think outside of the box. But yeah, um, I, I, I've had a life, uh, about half of one. <laughs> I, um, so yeah, I mentioned to my wife, Helena, that I was going to be having a conversation with uh, an expert in uh, the Montessori method. And she's like, the Montessori, is that the thing with the tiny furniture? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it is. Because I guess that's also a bit of an aesthetic that's been uh, trending on TikTok. It is an aesthetic. Yeah. T- TikTok, Mon- T- Montessori TikTok is incredible. Like there, and there, I mean, there are montages on TikTok where I'm just like, oh my God, I'm a terrible parent. Like I, I, <laughs> I watch, I watch these, um, these moms do this incredible stuff where the, their kid is like making egg- this two year old is like preparing coffee and making eggs Benedict. And, um, <laughs> you know, that's an exaggeration, but, but yeah. But I'd, I'd love to maybe just go into the details of the Montessori method. Like, let's go through the pitch. Let's talk about what it is and compare it to um, other teaching yeah. methods. Because in asking that question to Helena and then realizing that I d- didn't actually really know what it was besides tiny, cute wooden furniture and things, that I think I'd just, just love to dive into the details, basically. So let's let's go there. Yeah, I mean, when I first got into Montessori about, about 10 years ago now, I didn't know anything about it. And my impression of it, was even worse than it was. so. So my my parents, when I was young, I remember asking them. I was like, I was probably like five or six, and I was like, "What's Montessori?" One of my friends' younger brothers or something went to Montessori, and they're like, "Oh, Montessori is terrible. It's a place where the animals are in charge of the zoo, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. and like you don't want to be sent there." And I was like, "Oh my god, please don't send me to a Montessori school." And then basically, <laughs> I didn't encounter it again for thirty years. So um, I'm going to give you the historical answer, yeah. and then we'll we'll catch up to the present. So. That's nice. Um, in the early 1900s, this woman, Maria Montessori, was one of the first doctors or medically trained people in Italy in modern times. And she was um, working at an orthophrenic institute, um, which is a kind of non... All the, all the historical terms are not politically correct, but she, she was working with, uh, with, the, with the mentally ill people of her time. Um, and that, that crossed into different kinds of criminality and destitution, too, at the time. And she ended up working a lot with the children at this institute, who sometimes themselves had issues and sometimes were just the children of others who had who had these issues. And she started and and, uh, and she started to realize that a lot of their issues were actually issues of understimulation, of kind of not understanding the nature of early childhood deeds. And these, these were often very young kids, so like preschool age kids, like two year olds, three year olds, four year olds. Um, and, and she would notice things like people think that they're like animal hungry, like animals and that they're chasing after crumbs and they want to eat the crumbs. But it turns out that they don't actually eat the crumbs when they find them, they play with them. And and they're just so starved for intellectual stimulation that they're trying to find any object that can sate their curiosity. And so this, this led her down a kind of rabbit hole that culminated in her running this slum preschool, um, this preschool for extremely poor children and a slum kind of that doesn't, you can't imagine today if you grew up 
in, in North America. Um, really, you can't imagine if you grew up in North America, even in the last 200 years, European slums were something else. Um, and, um, and she worked with young children between the ages of, of, of about two and seven at this school that she set up. And she worked with a number of other people, um, teachers. And she was just thinking things through from scratch, trying to figure out what to do with these children. And she started doing things like, um, like, like what your wife describes. So she, so she contracted with carpenters to make child size furniture. She worked with, um, the, the psychologists and cognitive scientists of her time who were interested in, um, helping, um, you know, mentally disadvantaged adults, again, not their term for it. They, they would use much you crazy people, uh, re- retards is, is how they would describe Start it. Um, yeah. um, and, um, but they would have, have tried it. So people were experimenting, like, how can you get them to learn literacy and language and math? And, and how can you connect them to learning and subjects? And she started to u- use these materials that were being developed for adults with children. And so she would bring like math materials or, um, or just attribute comparison materials to children. And they were really into it. They were more into it. And they were into like dolls and board games and the other kinds of things that they had at the time. And so she was just, she was following with what what she thought the children were most engaged with and the most interested in and, um, and, and working with much younger children than anybody had really worked with before in a systematic way. I mean, people worked with children, but outside of the context of schooling or education and what made her, I mean, and there's a bunch of interesting things that came out of that, but what made her famous is some of these children at three and four years old, actually a lot of these children when, when they were young, she taught them how to read and write. And at the time, nobody thought that you should try to teach children how to read and write before the age of six and seven. It was thought to be quite difficult. And if anything, the consensus was moving in the opposite direction. The consensus was moving in the direction of stop pushing literacy on these poor children. That's like an adult thing. They don't understand the point of it yet. Wait until they're older, not even six or seven, but like let's wait until eight, nine, ten. This is the progressive method in the U.S. And, and a lot of progressives in Europe were pushing in this direction. And she had children joyously writing in the spontaneous way with materials that they chose to use um, when they were three and four. And so this made her internationally famous. Um, but the school, the school that she set up, the kind of tenor of it was give children a very specific structure. And that structure basically has two parts. Um, one is, is that it's an environment set up where children can, she called it a children's house where children can meet their own needs, where they can clean up after themselves, where they can take care of themselves, where they can feed themselves, where they can learn to dress themselves, um, it, it, to have a kind of carpented, architected world around children. So this is your wife's thing. Yes, the tiny furniture, but like imagine that plus like, you know, a tiny fridge and a tiny stove and a tiny like like everything. Like children were doing the dishes themselves. And um so that's one component. And the other component is um learning materials. Um she was a pioneer in learning materials that have a that have a very specific use and scope and sequence. So these aren't just toys. It's not just like um there are Lego blocks and you play with them and incidentally you might learn something about proportion they're designed to be used in certain ways with certain exercises that are done repeatedly by the children, but the children love and she tests them out to kind of make sure the children love them. And then once you have that environment set up, you give the children tremendous liberty. So the liberty to kind of take care of themselves, to take care of the environment, to use these materials as they see fit. And, um, and the guides job, the teacher's job, who she calls guides, their job is to kind of show the children how to use the environment, to inspire them to use the environment, show them how to use the environment. And other than that, it's pretty hands off, as as she kind of described it. Certainly compared to traditional education and traditional child rearing, it's hands off. It's actually more hands on than certain progressive methods now, because the pendulum has swung in the other direction. Um, so that that's the kind of basic picture, the look and feel of the Montessori school: liberty plus this this um, you know highly designed environment with with multiple components that are designed to help children develop optimally. Um, she was very, very influential. So a lot of the things that, that at the time were like novel, it's like, yeah, now everybody, like you buy children's furniture at Ikea, what's the big deal? <laughs> um, and and yeah. Fisher Price makes learning materials. Yeah. Teach you how yeah. to count. Yeah. Like a lot of this has kind of been pushed out, but that, but that kind of integrated refined system um, is still pretty novel. And, and, and it's one of the only learning method. Like there are no Dewey schools, John Dewey schools. There are no, like, it's one of the only kind of like, there's a method here. It's very specific. You can find it in almost every country on earth. It looks basically the same, um, especially in early childhood. It, it's a pretty refined method for um, for running a preschool classroom and toddler classroom. And how much of the method's efficacy is just like keeping out the Prussian model? Because uh, uh, I imagine a lot of this is just um, kind of a bulwark against more strict and authoritarian so of I don't. I, I actually I don't think. I think it's. I think it's a, a chunk of it, but I don't think okay. it's the majority. So, um, 
Um, every progressive educator in the early 20th century wanted that's not true some of them love the prussian model <laughs> um but um yeah, but, but all, all the all the ones that we now associate with progressive education alternative education they all were concerned with this prussian model this kind of german um state-run system that is about nationalism and is about kind of industry and military and and and, and the, the kind of prussian system was innovative in its own bizarre way and, and a lot of people were very impressed with it but like you know um dewey wasn't a fan of that model even Horace Mann, who's accused of lionizing that model, did not actually like it. Oh, um, there's, there's, there's there's some good um, – um, one of our think tank um, um, fellows, um, Carrie Ellard, has some good essays on the Montessori website mm-hmm. about this about this subject. Um, mm-hmm. But um, but the progressives hated Montessori. Mm-hmm. She, she was always kind of an outcast and an outlier. And it's, and it's because they were like, screw all these learning materials. We, we want like project-based learning where children are doing things like – shearing sheep and spinning the wool into thread and then making their own clothes and Uh, like like that's something mm. that children can actually understand like if you're bringing in like here i have this thing i don't know if the the audio is gonna or the video is gonna be available to everybody who listens to this but i just happen to have on my desk a binomial cube so this is um this is a binomial cube um it is a it is a puzzle for young children and for elementary children it teaches them how to do binomial factoring do you guys remember like if you if you like have in parentheses like or a plus b times you know um, I won't go through the whole song and dance, but this is a visualization of what that process actually means. Mm-hmm. And, um, and young children use it as a puzzle. They reconstruct it. It's very, it's actually kind of like a hard puzzle. Like I was, I was showing this to my wife. She was like, this is easy. And she put it back together. I was like, this is wrong. <laughs> 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 um, and, and then I, and then yeah. I explained it to her and she was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, um, um, she, she's sitting across from me right now. <laughs> But children just use it as a puzzle, and then when they get older, it's like they've been sensitized to like, oh, this is the actual meaning of math. A lot of progressive educators, early 20th century progressive educators, considered this to, this kind of thing to be like too structured, too much of an adult imposition. Um, mm-hmm. And so um, the fact that there is this pretty advanced literature and math curriculum that starts very young is still pretty unique to Montessori, I would say. So this is mostly um, – when people say Montessori method, they mostly mean for younger children, like ages – like. Th- three to nine ish or what yeah. are we yeah so montessori did most of her work in the really in the three to six age okay um and then and then every kind of three-year chunk you go out from that either younger or older it's like she did a little bit less work on that on it herself um and um and and it's a little bit less worked out and montessori is, is the most popular in, in the zero to six age really it's, it's considered an early childhood methodology i think i think that kind of pattern is very profound and influential and the work that she did for older students is very relevant too but um but when most people say the montessori method what they're thinking of is like that is a kind of preschool that is, that is what they're a kind of early childhood child care center so my synthesis in trying to like read as much about it as possible is that it's simultaneously sort of more structured and less structured than maybe like the status quo system. More structured in that it sort of posits like a developmental sequence that children should follow in order to learn things as well as possible. And that this sequence um, has it that children learn sort of different things at different ages. Um, And so you should present them like tools and objects in, in such a way at these ages so, so that they learn sort of in, in like an appropriate way um, but also less structured in that you just give them like once you set up this sort of synthetic environment in which they can operate you kind of just let them uh you let them loose in this environment for like long periods of time so that they can like explore their own curiosity um at will is that a fair way to put it that's extremely accurate yeah that's extremely accurate so um so the the, the kind of structure of the Montessori day um, the day starts with with a three hour work period, and um, this is a period where children are free to choose a work off of the shelf that they have been introduced to to get it out, to set it up at a table to practice it, and they could work on it for anywhere from like five or ten minutes if it's a younger child or a child who's like just not that into it and who decides they want to work on something else for 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 really hours, and and part of the reason to have a work period like that is that the 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 core. So there are a lot of specific skills that Montessori is optimizing for that we've talked about a little bit. Underlying all of them, the deep thing that Montessori early childhood is optimizing for is extended periods of concentrated work. Hmm. And the idea is is that if a child is interested in something and they're working on it and they've got that little furrowed brow on their head, like not not that they're like 
so it's, it's not just like they're running around and they're excited and they're happy, but there's a look that a child gets where they're like into something and they're working with their hands and they're trying to do it over and over. Mm -hmm. um, you do not interrupt that. That is sacred. You protect that. The child is building, to use a, a, a metaphor that I don't like particularly well, um, the child is building all sorts of kind of mental and characterological muscles um, mm -hmm. in, in, in exerting effort, trying something over and over that is difficult for them. Um, and you need an extended period to kind of get them into that state. They need to be able to choose something. They need to be able to even choose multiple things and kind of feel out what they want to do and then get lost in the work. And then when they're done, return the work to the shelf. And, and you need a long period. So like, Matt, I mean, I don't know what you guys do. Is this what you do for a living? Or are you just a professional podcaster? Or, <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> um, so, so whatever you do for a living, like imagine a day without meetings. Mm -hmm. And then like one meeting shows up on your calendar at like 1130. Like the, the, the day is like 50% of your productivity is cut, right? Like, mm -hmm. and that, that, that's the kind of idea behind the work period. It's like, it's like stop messing with the child. Like <laughs> everybody gets their concentration. Like if the, if the child is just expecting something to mm -hmm. like happen, like circle mm -hmm. time or like now we're having a snack or whatever, mm -hmm. like, like you got to give them a period where, the, where their expectation is like, it's, it is my job to kind of like get lost in something. So that, that's the, that is the, the beating heart of the day is the work period um, and being able to choose work and get lost in it. Um, and yeah, what you said in terms of what do they do with that time? Is it just like free play or what is it? Yeah. They're working with these materials that either the cognitive academic learning materials, the exploratory learning science materials or something in practical life. They could like wash some tables. Um, and, um, and if you get it at the right age, children love doing that. Mm -hmm. So, so one other thing um, that you said, is that she thinks that there's a kind of developmentally optimal time to, to introduce things. That is true in broad brush strokes. Um, it, it is true. Um, and, and, and that it's not so much, it's not a, this kind of Piagetian view that like first children are in a sensory motor concrete operational period. And then you introduce them to these materials. It's, it's, it's a little bit broader than that. Um, the idea is, is that there is a time when children will naturally find certain things interesting and challenging. And then, and then if you miss that time, then after that time, they will not find it kind of naturally interesting and challenging. So, so it's almost like a motivational aspect. There's a cognitive aspect too. Mm -hmm. But just to take a simple example, putting on a jacket. Most people learn how to put on a jacket when they're like three, four, five, maybe even a little bit older. And if you think about putting on a jacket, like it's nice when somebody holds a jacket for you mm -hmm. because it's like freaking hard to put it on. Like even as adults, <laughs> it's like one out of every hundred times you're like, can't find the damn sleeve. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Um, um, and, and, and for, for, for like a, a one-year-old, an older one-year-old or a two-year-old putting on a jacket is really hard and they actually want to do it themselves. They kind of like push you away when you, when you get in their face and, hmm. um, but they can't do it yet. And so it's just this frustrating thing for them, but there's this method. Some people call it flip up over the top of the people call it the Montessori coat flip, where if you lay out the jacket upside down and open in front of the child and teach them how to line their feet up with it, hmm. they can put both of their hands in it and flip it over their head. Oh. So why do this? Clearly, you don't need to do this to learn how to put on a jacket in life. This is not about teaching a practical skill. Um, everybody learns how to put on a jacket, um, and, and, and everybody's pretty good at it. Everybody's roughly the same level of good at it. Um, but if you get it when they're, when they're like 18 months old, two years old, it builds something. It, it like speaks to them. It's like, I can do it. I can do it myself. It builds their confidence. It, it does something to their soul. Whereas if you teach them how to do it when they're four, it doesn't do anything to their soul. And th that kind of consideration, if you kind of magnify that out with like self-care and work and, and language and math, it's like, when can you get to the child so that this speaks to them? And if you miss that window, it's like, yeah, now you have to learn how to write cursive when you're nine years old in elementary and that's a chore and it's just <laughs> drills. Is there a way to do it when you're three or four so that they're actually genuinely intrinsically motivated by it? And, and that's, that's kind of what the development is about. It's not so much like cognitively ready. It's like, what is a challenge? What is exciting? Um, what speaks to this age? It's like at any given age, there's a set of problems which are challenging but solvable with enough effort. Yeah. But yeah. that that set will be continuously changing, and you want to kind of give the child the opportunity to solve these problems when they're and, age. And, and 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 I would just add to that: if you miss it, and the child has to learn it yeah. anyway, it's something important like reading or yeah. math. Yeah. Then there, you have no choice. You've got like you're in a situation where like the child has missed the point where this is naturally interesting, mm -hmm. and you have to kind of like do something a little bit more schoolish with them. Because okay, that was going to be my next question. Because I wanted to square everything that was just said with the fact that uh, Maria Montessori got such excellent um, results uh, teaching children to read. Because I imagine um, putting on a jacket is yeah. uh, very different than spending uh, a couple hours going through um, a book. So what's hard about reading? 
you think about what's hard about reading for a child, there's a lot that's hard. So, um, so just to take a, a laundry list of simple things, one is um, most of the words in most books, you don't know what they are. Like you've never even heard them before, heard them spoken before. Even if you get a kind of simple children's book, you're going to very often encounter either it's like boring or like you're going to encounter vocabulary that you don't know. Hmm. Um, the whole, the whole grapheme system of writing, um, not only is it hard to kind of learn and memorize, these are like s- symbols that only differ from one another in subtle ways. Um, so it's just hard for, for a child's mind to wrap their head around it. Um, but it, it's hmm. also, um, even if you can recognize them, it's very hard, just fine motor control wise, extremely hard to produce it yourself in an accurate way. Like mm-hmm. the best three and four year old is just no matter how brilliant they are, no matter how much work you do with them, they're just not going to be that precise. They've got these stubby little fingers. Um, their brains are just not that developed in terms of fine motor. This is what they're working on, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And the whole alphabetic system is designed for adults who have extremely refined fine motor capacities doing something very, very well. There are other things too, but those are just a handful of things. Um, so what Montessori did is she tackled those difficulties. She, she kind of isolated and solved for those difficulties. So um, here is the scope and sequence, a sketch of it, of, of reading and writing um, for children. So um, first of all, there are a number of things that children do motor control wise to build, to build the writing muscles that have nothing to do with writing. So the way that we teach children how to wash tables builds the motion of being able to hold your arm like this. Um, a lot of the materials have these little pegs on them. And the way to best use those pegs is this like puzzle pieces, for example, the way to best use those pegs is the same methods and muscles that you use to control a pencil. So haven't even gotten to writing yet. There's, these are just like manipulating things that children are interested in doing. Then on the language side, there's a sequence of um, first you have children play these phonic sound games. Um, so what, uh, like what I'm looking around the room, what starts with this? You don't even say the letter name. It's just like, mm-hmm. s- or c- or uh, you're getting the children to notice different sounds. Um, after a lot of games like that, um, gradually, and, and a lot of vocabulary building that also happens in Montessori, it's like they're just cards with pictures and you're building all sorts of vocabulary. Um, you start to associate those sounds with what's called the sandpaper letters. So the sandpaper letters are written letters that um, the, the letter part of it is rough on the card mm-hmm. and you can trace it with your finger. So it's like, this is, you, again, you don't introduce the letter names. Mm-hmm. It's just like, this is the and then after you get good at that, it's like, what what are the what is this card? What objects does it go with? And they start to match this with a snake and uh, um, mm-hmm. you know a square and other things of sort of this um, just visually. And then you introduce them to a movable alphabet, which is just um, the letters kind of in in wooden block forms. And you have them very slowly and gradually start sounding out things that they want to say. So like if if the child wants it, the child has a cat at home. Like what's a c- What's an a? Ah, what's a t? Can you sound find those sandpaper letters in the movable alphabet and spell them out? And all of a sudden, the child is writing, and they haven't had to hold a pencil, even though they're practicing and preparing for pencils, and they haven't had to read a book. So it's writing without writing, and it's writing before reading. And so, so there's this very brilliant sequence that kind of tackles the problems one by one. So, so if children are writing first, they never encounter a word that they don't know. A priori, every word that they want to write is a word that they know. Hmm. Um, if children are writing using a movable alphabet, they don't have to use the pencils yet. It's important to learn how to write with a pencil and they're working on it, but, but you don't have to rush that. That can come later. Like first you're learning how to put, put, put letters together and then, and they haven't even started reading yet. And so, so there's this whole, there's this whole kind of rethinking of the language scope and sequence and relating it to like, what can children actually do? What are they actually interested in? How can we make each step as inspiring as possible? And you do that, you get brilliant results, and children love it. They don't hate it, um, and so it feels like play to them, even though even though it's work and learning. How does um, Montessori feel about play time without goals? Like, just so it seems like a lot of this methodology is yeah. geared towards like very specific skills. Um, how does it feel about kids like you know running around throwing rocks at each other and, <laughs> and <whatnot? laughs> okay. throwing rocks? At each other. Yeah. yeah, the Montessori rock throwing method. <laughs> I have this distinct memory in childhood of um, a bunch of kids deciding to run away from the adults and have a rock throwing. Thing. We were all into it, and like two kids lost teeth. And, like, oh, boy. It's like, oh, there's a reason why adults don't let us do this. Um, but um, so Montessori doesn't say a ton about it. Hmm. Um, I think if you if you read between the lines and look at the historical context, she thinks that it's really important. <laughs> um, it's just that she thinks that it's not um, that kind of unstructured imaginative play. Let's call it sure. Yeah. Um, is is important 
It's important both for, for kind of gross motor development and, and kind of getting a sense of how you can move. It's important for cooperative play. It's important even for, for developing your imagination. Um, it's just that there's this other thing that's also important and that children don't usually get. And so the way mm-hmm. that I think about it as a parent is, yeah, I want my, I absolutely want my daughter to have imaginative play and unstructured play and outdoor play. And that's, that's super, super important to me. But it's also important to me that she spends a few hours every day with goals that mean something to her that are challenging where she's pursuing her needs and learning something. And if you just get the, the first thing, the kind of unstructured play without, without the latter thing, I definitely think that she's going to be missing out on something. I would worry that she's not building the kind of the, the, the goal pursuit, value pursuit, knowledge pursuit, interdiscipline and structures. Um, I don't think that those just come along for the ride in, in unstructured play. I see. Okay. So if I'm a parent and I walk into a Montessori classroom First, I witness a lot of tiny furniture, but then after I get over my shock, what 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 differences am I like? Presumably, there's going to be these long long hours of uninterrupted work. Is that going to be the main difference I'm going to notice, or like what what's going to strike me as I sort of like walk into a Montessori classroom? May, may I just quickly hop in just to say that um, as a new parent, I don't rem- <laughs> and as a human being, I don't remember my preschool experience. And so yeah. when you uh, answer, can you also contrast to what we would expect to see just going into another preschool? Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, mo- most pre most preschools that you, s- that you see today, I'm going to be a little bit unfair to Kendra care because, because it's just the center of the page example or Jim or, or, or a lot of these. Mo- most of them are like, it's, it's largely play-based. Um, so, so there is a lot of unstructured time for the children to run. You might have like an hour block or a 90 minute block or whatever, where it's like, we're going to play inside for this hour. We're going to play outside for this hour. Then we're going to have circle time and do songs for 30 minutes. So there's a kind of structure to the day, but it's mostly around playing with toys. Um, amongst the different toys, so, so the toys will be things like blocks that you can build with dolls. Um, there'll be a dress-up area. There'll be a play kitchen. Um, some of those things will have even pretty good like learning components. Like they'll be, a, they'll be somehow indirectly about teaching you math skills or teaching you cooperation or teaching you how to read and write. Um, there might even be some structure in the day around like this is the 30 minutes of the day or the hour of the day when the older students come, come together and we do a reading lesson or we do read aloud or mm-hmm. um, we learn something about the alphabet. There will be like a little bit of that. that that's what kind of what a preschool would look like. Um, yes. We could talk about infants and toddlers, by the way, separately, but I'm just picking the three to six age because it's, it's easier to contrast. You will occasionally find preschools that are like. Am I allowed to say tiger mom still that, that, that are, um, that, that are, um, you can just edit that out if it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that are, um, that are like, so Mandarin immersion programs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is a common place to find that or, or a language immersion program. Um, it's, there's a lot of drill and kill for three and four year olds that there's a lot of like, um, there's, there's flashcards effectively, or, or there's, there's kind of like call and response. It's, it's quite structured and for, for quite an extended time, it feels like the children are in. Class, little classes or little tutoring lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you go to like, um, you see this a lot in kind of, um, like I see this a lot in, in, in like certain corners of like New York or Hong Kong where, where the academic kind of the school market is pretty competitive. It's like the day is quite structured around something class-like um, where it's, it's not so much free play. It's like we have our science time and we have our reading time and, and they may try to make it fun for the kids, but it's really like the teacher is directing the classroom. Um, in Montessori, what you will see is i mean when i first went into a montessori classroom when i was you know 30 um it felt to me like so i I had a very happy childhood um and and the thing that i remember in my childhood is like hours at the creek i I grew up in the rural southeast hours at the creek like catching salamanders building dams like i had these little projects or i would get lost in legos Mm -hmm. and like really spend hours or like all day building these very elaborate constructs Mm -hmm. um um feels like that so it feels like you're in a place where a bunch of children are lost in work um there's a hum of social activity too so but but by and large children are working in either individually or in twos and threes you know, like gathered around some project gathered around like a map that has like every country in the globe and the children are like putting it together as a puzzle and mapping mapping the flags and you're just like what the hell like how do they know all the flags or or they're kind of like working on some just some sort of puzzle or block exercise but they're like really into it and they're working quietly by themselves and they have that furrowed brow look or they're like cleaning up something with a friend they're like there'll be two friends in the corner like washing windows Hmm. um and the guide is the guy it's quiet there's a hum of activity but it's, it's relatively quiet and the guides in the classroom are the adults in the classroom are like circulating observing like getting down on on their getting down at the child's level and like talking to them a little bit 
Um, they might circle around to some children that aren't doing very much and be like, can I, can I interest you in a presentation? And they might bring them to an area where they present some materials to them and get mm. them into some work. Mm. Um, it feels very different. It, it feels like, like a kind of old world Ikea aesthetic plus like uh, an open office work plan plus, I don't know, like a Lego. I, I don't know exactly how to describe the blend. Um, I mean, you should just watch videos of the monastery and you can, you can Google them or, or get on tech talk um, as, as the mm. data was saying, um, but it, it feels pretty distinct. It feels, it feels different. This is so interesting. So I'm imagining I'm a, uh, let's say a preschool teacher. Um, I'm not part of the Montessori method, but I like what you're saying and I want to, kind of start adopting some Montessori practices just in a non-Montessori place. Um, would it be something like you kind of surreptitiously leave some challenging toys and puzzles around the, the play area and then are careful to not interrupt the, um, the children when they're uh, intensely trying to solve these more perhaps challenging um, puzzles and toys. If you, you, can, you, you can do that. It's, it's, I think in, in general, if you want to systematize it in your classroom and you, and you want every child to, to kind of like participate in this, that's not sufficient. Um, but, 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 um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, when, when I, I mean, when we have babysitters, um, for our toddler, you know, one of the things that I tell them is like, look, if she's into something, like, don't feel like you've got to jump in and play with her. Just like pull out your phone and like yeah. mess around nice. on Instagram for yeah. a while. Yeah. And, and like, what, like whatever she's into, I don't care how, how kind of exciting or trivial she is uh, or, or the, the activity seems to you. Um, so, and, and you can, and you can think about like, who are the children that I have? What are they going to be into? And then you also have to think about like, what are they going to be into? Like where they're kind of working on it. And it's not like they're going to be into it as like, I'm going to turn this big block into a lightsaber and like, and they're like concentrating on like having a lightsaber battle with their friend. Like that's again, nothing wrong with that, but that's not the kind of distinctly Montessori mm. work that, mm. that we're looking for in our classrooms. So um, part of the reason why there is the specific curriculum and the specific scope and sequence is that it's things that have over a hundred years of practice in many, many different cultures and countries been found to, if you present them to children in the right way, be generally engaging and challenging. Mm -hmm. And you can find that you can really find that with anything for any particular child. But if you kind of want to bring that to a classroom, I think you need to start thinking about like, okay, like if I put these blocks next to the other toys, are the children just going to naturally engage in imaginative play with them as they do with mm -hmm. the other toys? Are they going to kind of solve it like a puzzle or, um, mm -hmm. you know, how do I inspire this kind of work that I want to see? And that takes more work from the teacher than just leaving work out generally. As a parent who would be considering putting their child into a local Montessori school, what should they look for um, to make sure that the method is say, being taught correctly? Is there, yeah, is there so a few things just off the top of my head? Is there a three-hour work period at the beginning of the day? Can they talk intelligently about what happens there? Can you observe? It's hard to observe during COVID sometimes, but um, I mean, in general, my advice used to be like go into the classroom and observe. Like, what do you see? Do you see concentrated work? Mm -hmm. um, um, there's other kinds of um, indirect red flags that I would look out for. Um, so one very common one is, are the walls covered in things that are A, not at the child's eye height, mm. and B, that most of the children in the class can't read? So like, like let's say that there's like an inspirational quote, like as you come in and there's like a lot of things like that. It's like, who is that for? Interesting. In the classroom. It's not for the, it's not for the children, right? Um, so um, um, things like that. Um, is, the, is, the, is the environment really optimized for the child? I definitely think, I think it's worth looking at, um, are the teachers trained? And I say that without at all being a snob about training. We have our own teacher training that is like very radically different than typical Montessori training. So that I think the world of, I think that you can find somebody that's Montessori in spirit and kind of like a self-starter that's never taken any training, but it's like, how does the school think about Montessori practice? Like, is it something that they're thoughtful of and training is a kind of proxy for that? Um, so it's worth at least asking about, um, um, those are just three things off of the top of my head, you know, and yeah, Montessori is, it's, it's, it's not trademarked or regulated or anybody on earth can hang a shingle that says Montessori and people often do because the brand has a certain kind of cachet and, um, you know, just be aware of that. Montessori is, it's not like McDonald's. It's like fast food. If that makes, I mean, not that Montessori is fast food in quality, but like, like when you think of a, about a Montessori school, think about like I'm selecting amongst many different chains or many different right. kind of sub brands of Montessori or particular implementations. It's not like I'm going to a franchise. I'd love to move the conversation slightly to Montessori at higher um, age 
Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just say a couple of things at the outset and you can follow up. So one is that, um, Montessori and her son and her collaborators did a, did a, a quite a bit of work in lower elementary. So the six to nine age, I haven't even talked about mixed ages yet somehow, but anyway, um, the six, to, the six to nine age, um, some considerable structural work, less curricular work at the nine to 12 age. So by the time you're in upper elementary pushing into what we would call middle school, middle school didn't exist at the time. Um, but, um, as a distinct category, but, um, you, you, you start to kind of like, if, if you're just like a teacher that goes through the standard materials, you start to like run out of material. You're like, mm-hmm. okay, I've got a student who's like, they need to learn something about gravity. Like what's the lesson yeah. on gravity? What are the materials in gravity? There's like nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's so where the rock throwing really comes in, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. that's right. yeah. Um, and then in adolescence, she did some really cool experimental work both her she did and and her collaborators in terms of particularly what middle school should look like Um, and she had a model in mind where the students went away from home to live on a farm part of the time Mm -hmm. and where the school and and to run the farm as a business not just like a toy like let's work on the field and play around and run around but like yeah like you're responsible for these crops and you got to go to the market and sell them that's half of your time and the other half of your time you're like you're learning economics and, and, and kind of studying she said very very little about high school um, so let me just speak personally. Um, uh, you could kind of, you could look at the landscape of like, what does this look like in the Montessori movement? And what is the cutting edge of adolescent thinking? How I think about it is Montessori did a lot of work in the early years to show us that, um, a lot of the distinctions that we think of in education, like between the, like the, 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 like to what extent should children be left to be free to their own devices? And to what extent should there be like a rigorous program that they're put through? A lot of those are actually false alternatives that you can, that you could, there's a third way where you can have like maximal freedom and child-centered education and also a lot of structure and a lot of rigor and a lot of academics. And these two things actually dovetail really well together. And people, people are making a false choice um, when they think about that. At that level of thinking, at the level of like deep principles, let's reconceptualize what education looks like. Let's think about like concentration and work periods and a different role for the guy and a different role for the environment. That applies throughout education. Um, but what that looks like at different ages was only partially worked out. And, um, and the vision, her vision for what it looked like, even, even kind of like taking the farm school, middle school model. I mean, the way that I take that is like, that is one way you could run a middle school. Let's look at the kind of spirit of that and think about how you might run a middle school in the middle of downtown Baltimore. Like, I I don't think that you want the farm school model. So what are the principles there? Well, you want the children running a business of some sort and you want them to be involved and you want it to also be integrated with academics. What does that look like? Why is that? Let's think about why that is because she wrote much less about this than she did at the other ages. So there's more fresh thinking. needed. Um, Just one tiny follow-up question there because what's the relationship between Montessori and technology? Because I imagine that as you get a bit older, one of the... Prime, like the primary places that people uh, think and explore is uh, using a laptop on the internet. Yeah, well, I would cite Montessori's 1907 essay, Laptops in the United States. So obviously, this, yeah. is, this is an area where <laughs> any Montessori educator, you're going to have to do kind of first principles thinking. You're going to have to say, like, what like what do I believe about these principles? The world has changed. Um, it's interesting. To, it is interesting to note historically that Montessori was like, she doesn't get enough credit for this. And then the Montessori movement is actually a little bit allergic to this but um she was very interested in like early video technology she was like what you can like show children like a video of an elephant holy crap that's like way better than seeing the picture and most children Mm -hmm. are never going to be able to see an elephant in real life so we might as well show them the video that will be so inspiring to them Mm -hmm. and she had in mind like little carousels that you would like spin and like (laughs) you know like these kind of like movie movies in the original sense of movie um, moving, moving pictures yeah we we do a lot with technology in our schools, um, especially in the elementary age and especially in the upper elementary age, including introducing children to things like typing, introducing children to things like internet research and internet searches. I mean, to be frank, children, I mean, my daughter knows how to use an iPhone. She is 21 months old. She can actually like control, she can like get ready for this Veda. Um, she, she can like, she, she'll, she'll like, like we gave her the phone to watch a movie of herself and walked away and came back two minutes later last night. And she had like pulled up a YouTube video of like, like the sound of music somehow, which, which she loves. And we we're like, how do you do that? Like, right. And she, she was like rearranging our apps on our Apple TV. Like there's, wow. there's things on our Apple TV that where she's like made things. I'm like, I don't know how she did that, but we, we don't know how to undo it. <laughs> um, so, so children get children in, you know, the developed world get exposure to technology. And that ha- I think that that has to be part of your thinking as an educator in terms of what am I adding here? Um, what am I adding both in terms of like core, like, so if, if, if you think like 
social media, lots of risks, also potentially great benefits. One of the main risks is that if you engage in it before you have a certain kind of social cognitive self maturity or self control, like you get sucked into a kind of popularity context and you get addicted and like, okay, so like a lot of our thinking around technology is like, how do we build this core character such that children aren't, are, are like maximize the benefits and minimize the risks, right? Um, 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 but, but some of it is like actually skills, like, like research skills in particular and typing skills in particular are two, two really, really big ones. Um, there are some people that, that are uh, not, not higher ground people, but higher ground adjacent people who are working on really interesting things in terms of um, th- there's so much great stuff on the internet for children. I mean, how much children can learn from just YouTube? Yeah. Forget about mm-hmm. like a dedicated learning technology, but like YouTube is the best learning resource ever created. Um, I say that despite being a diehard Montessorian and um, you beat site, beside, despite the fact that YouTube is not typically thought of as ed tech, like you can learn anything on YouTube. It, it's still a little bit hard for children to use it independently. So often, especially yeah. like a three, four, five, six, seven year old, like you've got to go to your parents and ask them to help you search for things or ask you to help work things up um, or to, to help them curate your experience if you really want it to be optimal. I know people who are working on that problem. Like, how do you make it so that children themselves can interface with the internet in a really productive way? That's unsolved. No, this is so interesting. So I'll, I'll tell you what I've been thinking about. This may be just so odd, but so I'm a PhD in, in computer science. And recently I've been trying to figure out how to, get Georgia, my daughter, a laptop set up in such a way that she has to problem solve her way and learn code by the time <laughs> she's like, so give her like a terminal window um, mm-hmm. to get access to YouTube, for example. So she mm-hmm. has kind of a struggle. And I think that tech and computers are a great domain for frustration and problem solving. And this like, how do I get that jacket on? And ah, I get the yeah. jacket on. That, that kind of thing. Um, and so I don't know if that's like a bot story about the mentality, but it seems totally yeah. maybe adjacent to it, which is like set up an environment that's challenging, but yet uh, achievable with enough persistence. Yeah. And, so, so I mean, probably you both went through this as kids, some version of it. I definitely, so I was like a um, very, very early adopter of the very, very early. And I was super lucky. I mean, nobody even thought of this as an opportunity when I was a kid, but when I was like, you know, eight, nine, ten. Um, I was on like the Clemson University gave their professors like access to like a, a command line interface internet where they could use mm. cutting edge email programs like Pine, and um, uh, you know it was all command. There, were, there weren't web browsers yet, um, and I got I got into that stuff when I was a kid, and um, and I mean in retrospect, it's one of the most valuable things that that anybody could have given me, and nobody knew that at the time. People were just like. Let's try to make Matt go outside and play some more, um, <laughs> um, um, which was also good. I'm grateful that people did that. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, 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 no, nobody has yet worked out the Montessori scope and sequence of computers. So, um, and, and you can think about that both from the perspective of understanding. So um, both understanding physically what a computer is and more abstractly the kind of logic of a computer. There's, there's kind of different levels in terms of... Um, um, you know the Turing state machine, um, the different the different level, layers of abstraction for 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 logic that you can have, um, how that how that interfaces into every anything. I mean, what I would like children to, under, to understand about computers, regardless of how they use it, my my goal is that they understand conceptually that computers are a combination of math and machines that implement that math such that humans have figured out how to make math do almost anything that humans wanted to do. And that is a magical thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that means like we figured out how to use math. I love that, you know, implemented and implemented in metal. Like we figured out how to turn sand from the beach into this math machine that lets us have conversations with grandma. Over love it. Time. Like all that is math. And, and like, and, and it's like magic. I mean, if the default is not that people think of things that way, most people do not think of computers that way. And so there's at least a kind of like, grounding level how do you get that what's the scope and sequence of that like do you approach it historically do you start with the turing state machine and babbage and all this stuff or is it like does that not make sense um is there like a wooden material that children can play with that will teach them about logic gates a lot of people have attempted Mm -hmm. things like this there's a whole um thought there about like just what computers are much less how to use them Mm -hmm. um that that hasn't been worked out yet some people um at wildflower used to work on this um this monastery organization so there have been attempts but i don't think that anybody including us has been super successful at, at just like really implementing it. Yeah. Is there a aversion to technology within some parts of the Montessori? Yeah. Oh yeah. Much less so now than two years ago. So COVID has really changed people's views on um, like two years ago, if you had been like, we're going to do a virtual Montessori program, you would have been excommunicated. <laughs> um, and now <laughs> it's like, yeah, obviously 
human development doesn't stop in the face of a pandemic. Like, let's use all the all the resources available and let's let's think about it. So, um, but um, yeah, there, there's a there is a streak of Ludaism. I don't yeah, um, yeah. In, in the Montessori world for sure. How do so? My sense is that the Montessori method in general is uh, averse to like tests, homework, like standardization of of that sort. I guess one, how does that? Do you think that would proceed if the Montessori methodology was like pursued into higher grades, like high school and stuff? And then two, how does this interface with like the external world? So presumably you have kids graduating from these programs, then they have to go to like, you know, junior high, high school or like college. Like at some point you have to sit down, you have to write a test, you have to study for stuff you don't like. It sucks. Mm -hmm. Or you get given a task at work that you just is not very illuminating, but you have to struggle through like, you know, what's the relationship between like Montessori and then uh, post Montessori. Okay, so 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 the last thing you just said is a different issue. So so let me say yeah, a couple minutes on that. So so Montessori so Montessori's view of un, the unpleasant task mm-hmm. um, is that the way that you actually learn how to do that is by learning to do challenging pleasant tasks. So so there there is no there is no specific localized spe- functionally special mental muscle of forcing yourself to do something that you don't want to do. What there is is a kind of general capacity to do things that are challenging and to persist through challenges. And the way that you build that capacity most naturally, most joyously is by persisting through challenges that you're actually interested in. And then that strength transfers by extension into things that you're not necessarily as naturally interested in. So, so th- I mean, this is Montessori's solution to this problem is that it's not interest versus effort. What you, what you need is the interested effort. Mm-hmm. And then that lets you um, kind of um, – do things that aren't kind of naturally interesting to you when, when you see fit um, as you get older. Um, okay. So that, that's point one. So, but that, that, so on assessment, um, so I am much more friendly to even standardized assessment than the vast majority of Montessorians. Um, even if you take particular ones like the SAT, mm. which is a kind of um, weirdly scholastically evolved and developed intelligence test, essentially, it's not as bad as most most critics think that it is. It, it's a decent test of reading comp. It's a decent decent test of certain aspects of, of logical and mathematical reasoning. I don't think it's all that either. But and, and it's and, and there's a pathology around how it's used. Hmm. So so your whole life ends up revolving around um, the, these test scores, and you don't even take the test until you're in high school, and and, it, and it's this this kind of weird bizarre thing. And so um, I, I, I never know exactly what to say about. Um, about it kind of qua test and, and qua you know thing that exists as a social institution that's probably deeply harmful to many people um, mm-hmm. um but but i mean so so there's standardized tests i i do generally think that we, we should be probably doing more with standardized tests not necessarily spending more time on it with students or optimizing the student's experience around it more but we should as as people who are interested in education and society be innovating around what are things that we can do to tests that are pretty low stakes and low key mm. that are standardized in some way and that give us a sense of where a child is and what a child can do? But sorry, by we there, do you mean like society in general? Or you mean Montessori? Yes, like, okay. society in both. Yeah, and, and Montessorians are, tend to be pretty um, assessment diverse and test diverse. Um, um, most progressive educators do. Um, you know, it, it's it's. Um, I don't think it's a good thing. I, I think it's 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 more. In, it's it's less an area that we're like it sucks. Um, and we need to avoid it and more of an area that it sucks and we need innovation to make it better. Um, on the grade side, no grades, I do think suck. I mean, first of all, there's, there's all the grade inflation issues where like getting, you know, I mean, I used to be a college professor, like, like I cannot tell you the number of students that have literally cry- not go a semester in your office without a student crying because you gave them a B. Yeah. Um, um, and there, there are kind of structural reasons for that. Grades are just not a good way to kind of assess something summatively. Um, that the thing that I said very early on in this conversation about school is about getting easy tasks that you're expected to do perfectly. And life is about getting hard tasks that you're expected to do very imperfectly, but, but that in a way that still matters and, and adds up and that you get credit for mm. like grades are just like the epitome of that. It's just like, you want the hundred, you want the a, it just teaches you the wrong thing. Like, mm. uh, like if I do like pretty well on this podcast and like a decent number of people hear it and one person reaches out, I'm going to be like super happy. Like, you know, that's not an A plus like that. Right. That's like a C, but that that's like, like you should be happy about a C, right? Um, um, it just teaches you the wrong thing. So, so grades suck homework. I generally, I mean, generally I think you, if you're not getting the kind of learning that you want the student to do in, in the school day, um, you're doing something wrong in your education system. So, so um, there, there should be kind of time away from school. School is a specific thing. Um, but um, 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think my model for the best assessment system that I know of that exists is the Boy Scouts. Do you guys know hmm. the Scouts? Fascinating. So, so um, in the Scouts, you have the whole system is very, very interesting. So you have merit badges. Mm. And to get a merit badge, it's not just like some adult says you deserve a merit badge and you get a merit badge. You have to decide that you want the merit badge. You, the learner, decides that you want the, the you know basic mm. not merit badge or whatever. Um, you go through a series of tasks that has options in it, but that also has a certain kind of structure in it. And there is a manual for each merit badge that 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 tells you like what counts as having earned this merit badge. There's a number of things that you need to fulfill to do it. There are some options, some requirements for what counts as fulfilling it. And there, there's like a whole kind of worked out manual as to what it means that you have this merit badge and it's taken quite seriously. As a whole, like I stopped being a Boy Scout when I was a Wolf Scout, I think. So um, I, I don't even remember what the ranks are. It's like Cub Scout, Wolf Scout, Boy Scout. So, th- so there are like a, like a small percentage of, of scouts, mm-hmm. probably like mm-hmm. a fraction of 1%, go through this whole multi-year thing and as adults mm-hmm. earn Eagle Scout status. There's, mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. Being an Eagle Scout, it's something to be proud of. People put on their resumes. There's like a network of Eagle Scouts. It clearly, <laughs> oh, does, wow. it clearly does something to you. Nice. But there's yeah. no shame in dropping out as a Wolf Scout. If you drop out as a Wolf Scout, you yeah. are still a Wolf Scout. So, so it, mm. it's kind of like solve. It's, it's like mastery learning across the board where it's kind of like each step is a real achievement. Each step is something to be proud of. You get the students buy-in. There's a real assessment process. There's even buy-in to the assessment process. You're proud of the badges. I I mean, that Mm -hmm. doesn't all generalize to a school context, but it's just, it's the closest thing that I've seen to like, it's an assessment system where there's buy-in, it's mastery based. It matters. There's not inflation. Um, 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 It just works and people are proud of it. And uh, that's the kind of thing that we need to see in school. This is so so fascinating. I have never contrasted uh, scout badges yeah. and uh, letter grades before, but I think that's an interesting comparison. But it, it strikes me that the function of grades, like grades serve multiple functions. So if I was an educator in, say, um, a university setting, and I want my students to learn some mathematical technique, which I know will be beneficial to them further down the road, but at the moment they may not see the, the benefit, grades and assigning grades to that task is a way to incentivize um, but then grades are also used as like a measurement system, right? To, to see which students are better than which other students. Um, yeah. So, Gra- so grades, start- are, u- grades yeah. are used as, a, as an incentive system in a way that is bizarre because college mm-hmm. grades don't mm-hmm. in fact matter. I, I mean, what employer actually looks like a college transcript? Maybe there, there are some who do, but, um, yeah. 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 um, um, and then, um, and yeah, it's also used to kind of measure your progress and to rank you in comparison yeah. with other students. It, it's, um, um, I mean, I think, I mean, especially in, in, in math, what you want to see is, can the student actually do this thing? Yeah. Like, that, like there's a thing, can the student do it? Can they do it well? Can they do it in a number of contexts? Yeah. It's a definable thing. Probably it's something that we could write tests or exercises on to assess without, yeah. without too much trouble. Um, and somehow, somehow that's attached to this grading system. Um, and other areas. I could take a case. derivative badge. I was imagining <laughs> like the, yeah. the badge. Is, <laughs> that's so cool. Or even, or even like, a, um, group the six most common derivative rules into, into yeah, a set. And yeah. it's like, I know the derivative shortcuts, derivative shortcuts guru or something like that. And and you yeah. could even have like an accolade of derivative shortcuts. Yeah, it's, it's like, like, it's like you do the hacks, of, like, yeah. like you, yeah. you can, like you can use like GPUs to like yeah. do, do fast transforms and get derivatives faster than anybody else. Like, like you can imagine <laughs> the whole series of stages, right? Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so you said, so in Boy Scouts, people opt for the badges, right? So they have to say, like, I want this and now I'm going to pursue it, which reminds me of something you've said in another podcast, maybe the New Liberals one. I, I can't remember which one, which you said, Mon- that, you know, a big distinction between Montessori and traditional ed is the element of like assent with the learner. So like education and learning is something that has to be assented to by the person who wants to learn instead of um, it's not done to them. <laughs> you know, it has to be done with their consent. You can't just be lectured at or taught at and expected to actually like learn it. You have to be like, actively engaged in the yeah. process. And I do like this a lot. Um, but I can imagine that as you, especially if Montessori becomes more popular at higher grade levels, that there's a bit of a tension here between um, assenting to learning things, which will naturally follow the lines of my interest And having to come out of some sort of education system as like a human who knows some broad array of facts about the world, right? Like, what if I never want to know anything about history? Presumably, we want people coming out of high school to know something about history. Is there like, is that a false uh, dichotomy in my head? I believe that. I think that everybody should know quite a bit about history and quite a bit about European history, even in particular. Um, So, so, um, 
So let me just start on that issue. There is a lot that you can do to get somebody interested in something. Mm. And there's also a lot that you can do to make somebody make sure that somebody will never be interested in the thing. And <laughs> mo- most, yeah. of, most of what happens in education under the heading of motivation yeah. falls under the, under the latter category. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I think if, 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 if I was responsible for a child between the ages of birth and 12 and I could not get them interested in history, that's not some, that's not the child. That's on me. Like that, mm-hmm. that, that it's like, I have totally failed. Like history is awesome. Everybody is interested. Everybody is interested in history in the same way that everybody is interested in putting on their jacket. Mm. Everybody's interested in putting on their jacket when they're two. Everybody <laughs> like, like, I mean, this is I mean, sometimes I get monastery teachers ask us like, what if my toddlers just aren't interested in washing their hands? I'm like, you met a toddler. I've never met a toddler who wasn't interested in water and splashing around and getting yeah. like, like, like this is mm-hmm. a universal thing. There's no such thing as a toddler who's not interested in washing their hands. I think that there's no such thing as a human being who's not interested in history. If they're, if they're kind of set up in the right way in the right time for, to connect with them. So yeah. I don't like it, and, and that makes sense, right? It's, it's, it would be weird to say like, this is universally important, but some people don't care about it. That seems like a contradiction if you actually follow it through. Like, why are there universally important things that people don't care about? You should be able to get people to care about it. I mean, if you can't, like, what, is it really universally important? Is it just that some people are bad and dumb? Like, like what's your, what's your explanation yeah. for, for why those two things? So the second thing I would say is um, consent is complicated. And consent is extra complicated with children. But, but even, it's even complicated with adults. So just to give one adult example, a lot of people consent when they are eighteen to join the army, hmm. and they do it because part some subset of them does it because they want the structure imposed on them. They want to go to boot camp. Hmm. They want to have somebody yell at them and whip them into shape and to grab them by the collar and to not let them. But like, and, and if you look, if you just go and you watch a boot camp, it's just like what is this hellscape where everybody's <laughs> being bossed around all the time? Nobody has any free will at all. It's a place where consent is crushed you could even say the same thing like there are certain scout troops boy scout troops that are like a little bit more regimented there's certain sports teams that are run in a draconian way people still sign up for them voluntarily they love them they're not for everybody some people don't want boot camp i don't want boot camp uh, you know like but 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 the but you can you can consent to have somebody drive you and challenge you and to and to um and to really impose a lot of order on your life um for some people um, I mean, how that plays out in a school context is extra complicated. For some people, that's what they need and that's what they want. Figuring out that that's what they want and getting them to kind of assent to it, whether explicitly or implicitly, is complicated. Um, but, um, I mean, I do think that what a lot of people want in school is, I mean, everybody that goes to the University of Chicago wants wants, an, wants a challenging experience. Right. right. So, I mean, there are there are specific educational institutions where you know what you're in for. It has a reputation for being unfun. And that's part of the fun. Like people jokingly say, like this is a place where fun where fun goes to die, but mm-hmm. they still sign up for it. And, and 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 in a meta sense, it is fun for them. This is what they want. So that that that's just that's just a kind of complicating issue. And I, I think that um, I do not think of the issue of consent in parenting or education as literally doing what the child wants to do right this second. That's not what the child wants usually. That's I mean sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Like what what everybody actually wants is some sort of more long term view. And how that interfaces with a particular child's temperament is is um, can be tricky. So it has to be a very case by case thing. It's case by case, but but it's case by case within parameters that you can't articulate. Yeah. Um, nice. that, where where it's like you can, there's not not actually that many types of human being um, at this level that we're talking about, and um, and there are structures that work for everybody. Yeah, I think um, one thing that Eric Weinstein said that I really liked was uh, that there's no such thing as learning disabilities, but there is such a thing as teaching disabilities. And I like this idea that um, if, say, a student isn't learning math, it might be the fact that the teacher isn't competent enough to teach it, not that the student isn't competent enough I think, to, to learn I think it. that that's true in a lot of cases that we describe as learning disabilities. I think that there probably are such a thing as learning disabilities. But, but I'll, I mean, we're way too quick to – I mean, even, even in Montessori, we have this thing called child study. This, this, which, which is basically like a detailed observation practice where we try to kind of um, – really just like do nothing but watch a child for 30 minutes a day and, mm-hmm. and reset our expectations and prejudices. And like, it's, that's, it's, it's kind of misnamed. It's not about the child. This is like most child studies. It's like the teacher has failed to connect with the child. And the child study is about giving the teacher space to like really closely observe the child and, and, and reestablish their mental relationship with them in a way that's transformative for the child's experience of school. 
um, that is th- this kind of inner work of the teacher, as Montessorians called, is is like really, really critical. And I think we are way too fast to say, yeah, this child has a different learning style or this child has a yeah. disability. It's like, no, like, yeah. The, 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 like do your job. <laughs> so, so this is enough that, that I'm really interested in. So let's say um, I'm a high school teacher and I, uh, for uh, various reasons, I can't easily leave the public school system and switch to a Montessori method. But I can make subtle changes in the way that I teach my class, perhaps, that would um, kindle perhaps a better learning environment within the constraints of the, the current uh, teaching paradigm. Um, I'm just curious what advice you would have for, for such a person who uh, perhaps want, is inspired by a lot of the things you say, um, but has to work within the confines oh, of their, their uh, <laughs> uh, academic so for, first, I think it's really important to conceptualize and even to embrace the confines. So you have to surrender to the challenge of your situation um, as a teacher. And, and whether that means like even over and above the state standardized tests, your school district has decided that like they need to see these test scores in order to get certain funding things. It's like, fine. That's part of the job. Like, like let's, let's, let's kind of like take that serious. Like don't fight that. I think you have to kind of um, figure out a way to make that mean something to you um, and, and, and otherwise the rest of what you do is going to be lost. So, so part and part of the reason why you do that is um, you have to be able, like, you have to be able to conceptualize it in order to um, set up fences around it. So, so whatever the requirements are, I think you want to um, you know how like an immune system, like, kind of like puffs up around infections, and like, like that's kind of what you want to do around around what, whatever you think the worst aspect is, and like, the, like those are those are kind of like per, like the rest of what happens in the classroom is protected from that. And then a lot of, I mean, one of the most common things is like, there's this teacher um, in our schools who I love, this math teacher, who, um, when I first interviewed him, he had, he had already been teaching math at the school that we were requiring for a couple of years. I was just like, so what do you think you've accomplished with your students this year, your math students? Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Hell yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so, he, so he said, well, um, at the beginning of the year, all of my students had felt like math said fuck you to them. And so they were saying fuck you to math. Mm-hmm. And now they have a healthy relationship with math. <laughs> I mean, that that is that is the kind – I mean, that's – especially if you're a high school teacher, yeah. you are not teaching young children. You are inheriting students who are already internal – have already internalized pathologies from school. Like you, you have to think about you have to, you have to think yeah. about remediation. You have to think about their relationship to the subject. You have to think about inspiration. You have to like go on a student by student basis and say all of these students have missed most of their sensitive periods for being interested in most of what they have to learn in high school. Like, what am I doing to like hold their hands through it and try to rebuild that relationship and connection mm-hmm. and, and to inspire mm-hmm. them? What for some students that's going to be like straightforward inspiration. For other students, it's going to be like we're going to make a boot camp for you. Like it's going to be hard. You're not going to like it at first, but but at the end of the day, you're going to see results, and this is something you need to do. And here's how it relates to your life. And I'm going to pitch this to you and sell this to you and get you excited about it. I'm mm-hmm. not going to say no until like you like it's, it's going to look like non consensual math, right? <laughs> um, but um, um, I mean, you you got to kind of take it student by student and figure out what these students need and kind of what what where they're at in terms in terms of their you know almost certainly remediation required um, journey. And I say this part of the reason why I can say this with some confidence, apart from just my own schooling experience and anecdotal observations, is I taught at uh, I taught college students at UPenn hmm. and Franklin and Marshall College, so good Ivy League university, really good liberal arts college. You get really bright students; they all had these pathologies. Hmm. I mean, most of what a college professor does with eighteen and nineteen year olds is deprogramming from school. So, if you so on that note, if you had. Um, like full or partial flexibility to change something about upper education. So maybe university in particular or high school um, and like we're able to change the constraints uh, that those systems as they exist right now impose on you. What would it be like? How would you change your the university requirements to make learning better? Just assuming you're getting students that already have some of these like pathologies. Yeah. So, I mean, Nobody likes this answer, but, but here, 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 here's, here's my kind of big picture high level answer. And there are reasons why, good reasons why nobody likes this answer. Push everything down three years, get rid of universities. High school becomes university and only some people attend and you start working when you're 15. I love that answer. That's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so the reason why people hate it is because, because people have this vision of like drilling preschool kids on elementary, yeah, right, class, right. which is not what I have in mind. Right. But, yeah, um, yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, most students who are in university shouldn't be there. I mean, I mean, so I, I've talked to like really good. I was talking to like 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 Brian Kaplan types who who like 
uh, I don't know if you know his work, but he's like very critical of education. He's like, look, I love my job. I think my students love me, but like 90% of my students, like I probably only reached 10% of my students. Like, what do you do about the, uh, the other 90%? I'm like, 90% of your students shouldn't be there. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Like, they're, like they shouldn't even be in, in school yeah. at this point. They should be off working somewhere. And we have this weird system where 21 year olds are still in school. Like most 21 year olds are still in school. It's totally insane. Um, life is life is postponed for so long. And and our school system is so bad. Like if it actually did its job and taught you anything in elementary and middle school, um, most of what you'd learn in high school and college would be obviated. And so, I mean, just, but I mean, the kind of general anchor is um, I'm very pro work. Like I think that work forms a part of the good life, and, and this is part of Montessori's philosophy too. And, and part of why she thinks it's important for important children important for children to like lose themselves in concentration young is like you're building a work ethic, you're building a love of work. Mm-hmm. And this extends into adulthood and, and the good adult, the adult who has a good life is one who loves effort in some mm-hmm. way, who finds dignity in work. And um, I just think that, that that's how, I mean, there, there's a million ways that you can work. I mean, we, we, we have a kind of prejudice against it as a society for reasons of child labor and for kind of classist reasons, I think, um, largely. Um, but um, I was working when I was 15 and I probably should have been working more. That, that jives so well with my experience of um, being in the university system because most of the people I study with, I say, don't love it. They don't love it nearly enough to endure it. Um, and I'm a, I'm a bit of a freak show on this because I, I frankly just love what I study. And to me, researching what I'm interested in is it's like playing a video game. Like when, when I'm actually playing video games, I wish I was researching. But I think for most people, it's, it's very much the, the opposite. Um, so... It works well for me because of my weird idiosyncratic nature and the fact that I lucked out in the field that I'm in. But most people I study with are not happy. And and so yeah. I think that your advice and your is, is just so spot on because I think many people go to universities thinking that this is just what success looks like. When it's it's one kind of success, but it's by no means the And only. also everybody has the experience yeah. of like being twenty seven and realizing what they should have actually done in university. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. it's like okay. Oh, like I should have like I, actually like these these four classes would have been really valuable to learn, yeah. And these ten classes were really worthless. And like if, if they had had like one or two years of work experience before they went, it's it's like like what school should look like is you go and work, and then you go and get a little yeah. bit of school, and then you go and work, and then you go. Yes. go I mean that's where things are going, right? So, um, um, so um, yeah. And then there then there's just the issue of there's this weird system where you're just in school for so long, way beyond where it's clear. It's like somehow this is setting you up for a job. And yet most students, when they graduate good universities, are like, I guess I'll do Teach for America for you or whatever the trendy <laughs> thing is now. That, that was yeah, 10 yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, but yeah. Um, like, um, there's a lot of failure to launch cases. Um, educators, the, the more humanistic the education is, the less cognizant it is of, of the kind of dignity and value of work, which is a crime in my view. Um, um, I just – there's, there's so many so many reasons why um, kind of working earlier actually helps education. And, and there's – have you noticed that there's a bit of a condescension towards the trades? Yeah, totally, yeah. It, and, yeah. And that I can't stand because some of the most curious and, and interesting friends of mine um, are in, in the trades. Uh, and I contrast that yeah. to some people who are getting I mean, their PhDs and are I just... Know. I mean, just... So, so I mean, this is this is a little bit personal and not everybody has to deal yeah. this way. But I, so yeah. like, I'm a philosophy PhD, um, mm-hmm. pretty... First blush is probably about as kind of snobbish and elitist as you guys get, and I am a snob, so I don't want to shy away from that. But um, um, I, I love manual labor, and I always have. Um, I loved I loved yard work when I was a kid. I still like moving. Like I don't even let my wife when we have to move apartments. I don't let her help. Like I'm just like I'm doing it. I'm packing all the boxes. Like I'm moving them from point A to point B. And, 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 she, and she's like, why? I'm like, because like you take things that were in one place and you move them to another place and that's satisfying and you're tired at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it accomplishes something and you get to see the value of your work. Our school yeah. set up. So we have yeah. 80 schools, 90 schools. Like I love going to a school and like unpacking boxes and building <laughs> yeah. stuff. Um, um, but, but this, I mean, even, even beyond that, like, even if you, even if you don't love it, like I do, and I don't know exactly why I love it. Um, I, I mean, if you're like a barista or you're working in fast food, like even if it's not your favorite thing, like it confers dignity. You're doing something like you're totally. providing a certain kind of value and service. You're learning, you're learning about interacting with other human beings. There are lessons mm-hmm. there. There's just kind of characterological lessons and life lessons mm-hmm. there. Probably providing much more value than mo- most PhDs to be <laughs> <Yeah>. honest. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that there is this, um, I mean, Montessori is really good on this topic on, um, I have an essay that, 
um, I think it was published in the Chalkboard Review a month or two ago called Vocational Training for the Soul. Nice. And I think one of the things that education should do starting from, from a very early age is um, it's, it's not vocational training and vocational experience in the sense of like setting you up to be a plumber or a stonemason or whatever. It's like setting you up to kind of like understand and love work. And that has a certain hands-on practical component, but it also has things like um, you should study the history of industrial progress and labor. And like that should be a part of the history curriculum. And you should see how all the different kinds of jobs that people have had. You should understand how supply chains work. You should understand like little things like being a fast food worker, being an Amazon worker in the context of these amazing global supply chains. And um, it should be elevating and, and you should you should see yourself as part of this project no matter no matter what profession you're on. Montessori is really good on this topic. Um, she's really good on like all work is intellectual, all work is manual. Um, you have to learn how to valorize this when you're a teenager, even younger. But but especially she thought that this is what the middle school student did on the farm is that they learned how to valorize manual labor. Anybody who can see the value of both and who can integrate the value of both has such a competitive advantage today because most people like pick a side. Even people who I really like, like um, you guys know Mike Rowe? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Their jobs. Their jobs. Their jobs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love I love his work and I love his methodology, but there's, there's, there's just like, there's like a little bit of like an anti elitist streak in it that, that I'm just like, no, like it's like, you could have your cake and eat it too. It's about, it's about loving everything. Like love the people who go to grad school for their PhD and love the people who don't, you know? And, um, and that, that I think is what Montessori was so good at is she's like, social workers are awesome and artists are awesome and bricklayers are awesome and bankers are awesome and stop telling me that there's a single job that's not awesome. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It strikes me. This is a, a big problem that I think most developed countries are going to face at one time or another, just this like sort of classism that you get between the higher educated and, and the trades and whatnot. And the U S seems to be on the forefront of it, but it seems it's like a huge coordination problem because even at an individual level, if you do not necessarily just value like higher education as an end in and of itself, if everyone around you acts as though they do, then you're incentivized to, for example, pay $200,000 to try and get your kid into like the, a college that's 10 places above your neighbor and, and stuff. And so, I mean, the thing, the thing that has to be accomplished is not making higher ed and, and kind of more creative intellectual professions less worthy of status. The thing that needs to be accomplished is making other professions more worthy of status. So, mm-hmm. um, so nice. more deserving of status. So, so it's, it's, um, um, we we need that kind of early American attitude back of um, like work, labor is awesome, work is awesome, all jobs have dignity without being without rolling our eyes or, or eyes or sticking up our nose without punching up. Like we mm-hmm. don't want to do a disservice to any of the incredible, amazing, aesthetic, creative, scientific, intellectual work that I think happens happens every day. We have to we have to like keep our eye on that being valuable too. Um, it's just like there is a there is a kind of I mean I don't think that the U.S. ever fully shook the idea of classes in in the 19th century around the time when it should have when when it Mm -hmm. should have been like wait in america there's no such thing as a class like this whole idea doesn't apply to us we didn't make that move and now we're still stuck with kind of higher and lower status professions i I think another dimension of the say the pursuit of higher education is um the failure to separate say university and learning uh, because learning and the pursuit of learning for its own sake can happen wherever you are um it can happen in a conversation at a park. Um, but I think that part of, uh, this, this conflation of say university and learning is that people feel that if they're not on a campus, then they don't have to learn. Um, or that if they want to learn, they need to go onto a campus. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that that, I think that that's on the decline. Yeah. Especially um, podcasts and YouTube. And podcasts and YouTube and long form content on the internet and Wikipedia. And like, I mean, when I used to say things like YouTube is the best learning technology out there, or Twitter is a great university. It, like people used to be like, yeah, but, and now pe- everybody's always like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. get it. like it's, it's kind of like this, this point is being assimilated. And I, I do think like nobody thinks that higher ed is going to be the same in 30 years. The question mm-hmm. is just like exactly what is the time and exactly what is it going to look like. But, um, I think it's a great time to be an educator. It's a great time to be a learner. This is a point that I make a lot. Like if you're a parent right now, holy crap, like there's never been a better time to be a yeah. parent. As, as yeah. crappy as schools are and as ossified as the credentialing system is, like would you pick any other time and why? Um, so many good things out there for, for learners, for learning. Sign me up for the tiny furniture because this was an amazing conversation. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, Any plugs or anything that you want to uh, plug before yeah. that we didn't ask yeah. you about? That? Yeah, one, one specific plug. So I teach this course on the history of education and we're just wrapping up V1 of the first round. So 
we start in early antiquity, um, kind of you know pre pre Socratic, and we go through antiquity and the classical era and the Hellenistic period and the Dark Ages and the High Middle Ages and the rise of the universities and the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment theories of education that didn't actually impact education and education in early America and then all the progressive educators and then we then we do Montessori and wrap up with the 20th century. So we're just finishing up the first cohort. It's awesome. Um, had a had a, a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred people take at the first round, including some really incredible people that like really push me. Some pe- people that are like also like PhDs and ed tech CEOs and things like that. So I'm trying to get as many people like that in the second cohort as I can. Um, and this might Amazing. even be this might be the last time that I run it. So I might I might kind of turn it into podcast or automate it. So this might be your last chance to to, to, cool. to run to, to run alive. And V2s, I can already tell you it's going to be better than V1. There's so many things that I'm going to change and improve upon. So. Sign up for that at yes. Montessorium.com. Nice. Um, there's a courses tab. You will see it prominently listed. Um, it might even be the only course that's listed right now. That starts, I think, at the end of February, V2. And right now you can get discounts. So nice. go ahead and sign up. But yeah, generally, just check out Montessorium. Follow me on Twitter and Bateman. Sign up for our newsletter. You know, if you like what I said, I say this kind of thing all the time. So <laughs> follow me. Yeah, I can personally attest that your, printer, your, uh, your uh, Twitter feed is well worth following. Um, thank you yeah yeah is, how long does the course run how many it's a it's a 12 week course okay yeah. cool 12 weeks um hour and a half um it's pretty luxury i mean we do some discussion and engagement every time but it's pretty much you're lecturing and then we do we run some optional discussion sections too so nice you're signing up for a podcast that you that you can attend live or listen to awesome uh, async if you want this was an amazing conversation i hope at some point to have you back to just talk about the yeah, sure. education yeah, and the uh Anytime. The whole anytime. course. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you guys were awesome. This was really fun. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Peter. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much.